It's all about strategy, about maneuvering the opposition, bending them to your will. What are you doing in my office, Dex? Winning. Hey guys, this video is sponsored by NVIDIA and MSI, so stick around until the end to find out how you can get your hands on the ultimate play with the MSI GF76 gaming laptop. This whole subgenre of indie first person shooters can often seem as wide as the ocean, but then deep as a puddle, and it's kind of getting harder and harder these days to find one that truly stands out. But I think I found one that fits the bill with Deadlink, a fast paced but precise FPS with a cyberpunk theme and roguelite elements. And while yeah, that might describe a dozen shooters that have come out in the last couple of years, there's just something about Deadlink that feels different. Impressive. Very nice. It went from something that I played for 20 minutes and just didn't feel like I was getting the hang of, to then finally clicking and something I couldn't put down for the next eight or so hours. There was a demo for this thing a few months back, which I didn't really have a chance to check out, you know, for various reasons. But it's just come out in early access on Steam, and if shooting cybernetically augmented Yakuza in an indiscriminate future sounds like your cup of tea, well, keep watching. Now, Deadlink's gameplay loop is pretty simple to explain, right? The way it works is that you enter a combat arena, then a bunch of enemies spawn in and attack you. You kill them in whichever way you want to, then can choose from often one to up to three ways to progress forward, each offering different rewards. You can choose from XP, upgrade tokens, a shop, but more importantly, player and weapon upgrades, and each of these often comes with a new implant, a randomly generated augmentation that fits into one of the player's slots, improving an aspect of your class. It's that old classic reward system catch prevalent in so many games, and it's part of what makes Deadlink so addictive. Because while you do start off pretty weak and not all that effective, after a few arenas, you really start to get a build going, and then you just become outright broken. Decimating everything you come across, assuming of course you know what you're doing. And, of course, assuming you get lucky, because, as is the case with all of these roguelike games, RNGs is, is one of your biggest foes. On top of that, you've got perma upgrades that you slowly unlock along the way here, spending all of that hoarded up XP and those collected tokens, giving you that much-needed incremental improvement for the next run kind of reminds me a lot of Gunfire Reborn in that way, a game where you start off as a cute little rodent or some other kind of creature based off Chinese mythology, but then you turn into like a murderous tsunami of broken abilities and overpowered guns. It's also kind of reminiscent of another robot-themed game called RoboQuest, where you choose from different robot suits and have to go through randomly generated combat arenas, picking specific rewards and going for a build along the way. Now, a run through both areas in the current build won't take you longer than 20 or so minutes, you know, assuming you make it that far, and it's kind of a testament to how hooked I got on this basic gameplay loop. That satisfying slow motion effect you get during the last kill in each area just really propels you onto the next room. I think it's like some kind of unwritten rule too for all these cyberpunk themed shooters to have a soundtrack that slaps harder than Will Smith, and this one here is no exception. This game has a lot of potential for being something you can just hop into for like an hour or so, see how far you can get in a couple of runs before then logging out and calling it a day. On the other hand though, if you're the type of person who wants to take the time to invest into the mechanics and unlock all of these upgrades, well, there's a fair bit of stuff to do there, so I think it can really cater to both crowds. The thing is too, you're not actually the one entering all these arenas, technically what you're doing is piloting like a combat shell. It's like an autonomous robot, I guess, that does the dirty work for you while you presumably sit in some kind of fancy chair, marinating in sweat, farts, and your general body odor. And right now, there's currently two shells to play as, which are essentially classes. You've got the soldier and then the hunter. Now, the soldier's armed with a shotgun and a rocket launcher, then has a grappling hook and a stun effect called the scramble. Scramble? Scrambler. The Hunter, on the other hand, has a revolver and an energy weapon called the Arc Cannon, along with a teleport ability called Translocating, where you swap positions with an enemy, and then he's able to drop down a holographic decoy and go invisible. So, all up, it's only four weapons and four abilities, which, you know, might sound simple on the surface, but the amount of customization here with all these augmentations and the weapon mods just adds so much depth, and it only gets more extensive the more time you spend with it. 
The soldier plays the most like what most people would be familiar with when it comes to an FPS, and that archetype of a shotgun and a rocket launcher is an easy one to get the hang of. Also too, it's like every first person shooter has to have a grappling hook these days, so there's a bit of familiarity there too, plus I mean the mechanic of stunning enemies ain't that new either. The Hunter though is a bit more of a specialist, able to dip out of combat when shit hits the fan, and get a bit more breathing room to control the arena a lot better. Plus the Arc Cannon is easily the most customizable weapon in the entire game. Now, by default this thing just fires out an arc of energy, hence the name I guess, which alone is pretty damn effective, able to pierce through multiple enemies. But then you can also add those elemental effects and turn it into what's basically a railgun. Impressive. The Toxic mod turns it into like the Bio Rifle from Unreal. Then there's basically like a lightning gun mod which makes it fire out a constant string of energy. And even the simple thing of adding these elemental effects to the weapons adds a lot more depth here, making them more effective against certain enemy types. Electrical damage, for instance, is really good against robots, whereas Toxic is better against armored enemies. And then of course, fire against flesh. Yeah, it's a bit of an age-old elemental damage system, and it goes back as far as a game like Borderlands, but just makes it more than spamming weapons over and over until everything's dead. But there's one very big mechanic to Deadlink here, which is front and center to the combat, and that's this idea of marking enemies. As seems to be the case now for a lot of shooters, Deadlink gives you direct control over your own resources, and this time around, it's your shield and ammo. Ammo can be found in bulk, scattered around every arena, hidden inside these floating containers called sea balls. Yeah, <laughs> sea balls. And it's as easy as punching one of these things to break them apart, like a futuristic piñata to get all those goodies inside. Shields, on the other hand, though, only come from killing marked enemies, and marking enemies is done by using your abilities. With the soldier, it means grappling into someone or stunning them with the scrambler. And with the hunter, it's about tricking someone with a decoy or teleporting into them. Also, what's handy too is that grenades are going to mark enemies as well, making it easy to tag a bunch at once here while they're all standing around in a cluster like some kind of Alcoholics Anonymous group. Then it's just a matter of finishing that enemy off when they're marked, at which point they'll drop a whole bunch of shield pickups in a fashion that looks very similar to an FPS game that I think we've all played not too long ago. I'm not going to say it, but I think you all know the one I mean. Yeah, it starts with D and it ends in Oom Eternal. <coughs> It's actually a pretty cool system though, because it really forces you to use your abilities and not just rely on spamming your weapons over and over. I mean, yeah, you can pretty much do that if you want to, but you'd be seriously handicapping yourself later on. Not to mention you're missing out on that glorious ASMR that you get from that punchy sound effect of all those shield pickups. But it's also more necessary than that, because health points aren't all that easy to come by. Refilling your entire shield can pretty much be done in seconds, but health really only comes from vending machines, because I guess in the future you can patch up all your grievous bodily wounds at the same time as you're buying a bag of potato chips. And despite your combat shell being, you know, pretty much death on two legs, you're still a bit of a glass cannon. So keeping that shield topped up is about as important as leaving the house with your pants on. You can perma-upgrade your max health and shield eventually, but you're still like a water balloon being thrown around a room full of sea urchins. Holy shit! Having those sea balls being the only way to get your ammo back for your heavy weapons and having them scattered around the arenas also encourages you to stay mobile and utilize the jump pads, which is kind of essential too, because your movement speed ain't all that fast. In fact, it's actually kind of surprising how slow it is, especially considering how fast your movement speed is in most other shooters these days. In most other games, it kind of feels like you're playing Duke Nukem 3D after popping steroids. <laughs> Off the back of that too, I can see how some people might complain about the ammo count being so low. But again, it feels like it's been done on purpose to keep you moving around the environment and going after those sea balls. Sea balls, man, they've got to think of a better name for that thing. <clears throat> I mean, look, if you had 50 rockets, you'd never go near one of those. So it feels like a purposeful limitation on the player's resources, so they have to engage with the game's mechanics. But what really adds the most depth here are the implants, and not the one your mum gets. And it would just be impossible for me to cover these, because I feel like even after playing for 8 or so hours, I was still coming across new builds and combos. Right, so the implants are those player upgrades you get after clearing a room, and every implant you come across can be equipped to a certain function or ability. 
You've got weapon swapping, along with using either ability for each shell, and then breaking sea balls. Again with the sea balls. Each implant group uses up a certain amount of battery power, so there's limits, but apart from that though, where you go is up to you. For instance, you could put an implant on weapon swapping that makes it so the next shot you fire is going to be elemental. Essentially meaning that every time you swap guns, you get a free lightning shot, a free fire, or a free toxic shot. There's another implant that reduces the cooldown of your abilities. So again, putting that on weapon swapping, you know, something you're going to be naturally doing to begin with, is automatically going to give you faster access to your powers without forcing you to change the way you'd be playing the game to begin with. I had another one too, where every time I swapped weapons, my gun sent out like a little homing projectile that hit nearby enemies. That's actually one of the more filthier implants too, are the implants that are tied to proc chance. Like there's one that gives you a 25% chance for a lightning bolt to hit enemies when you shoot them, you know, stuff like that. At one point I even combined this with the lightning gun upgrade for the arc cannon. And because that thing is essentially firing out constantly, well, it just ended up proccing like crazy, which felt very satisfying. You'd think that using the grappling hook and the rocket launcher is probably a bad idea, you know, because splash damage is a thing. But then I can put an implant on the grapple that gives me immunity to damage for 2 seconds after using it, which basically negates the splash damage entirely. I even one up to one point and added another one which made it so the first rocket I fired after using the grapple didn't use any ammo. An implant which also had the passive bonus of increasing rocket launcher damage by 30%. So I basically got a free buffed rocket off in someone's face without any of the downsides. Fuck you! you might have it so after using your grapple or the translocator, the next shot's guaranteed to be a critical hit, which means you can grapple into someone and hit them at point blank range for a guaranteed crit. I even had it during one run where every grapple would give me that guaranteed critical hit, plus I also had an implant where swapping weapons would give me a 15% critical damage bonus, something which I could also stack 10 times. So am I starting to paint like a bit of a picture here on just how over the top all of these upgrades can be? Even the simple things, like making you invisible after breaking enough sea balls can be a massive help during a run, and you know, get you out of some tight spots. But now, hold on to your ball sacks and consider too that every single implant has a passive bonus as well, from things like faster movement speed, more shield capacity, and a higher ammo count. So while the implant itself might not even be all that useful or apply to your current build, you can still at least take the benefit of the passive. It's just a staggering amount of possibilities, and this is at the point where there's only still two playable classes. Kind of crazy to think about the amount of options that the full game's gonna have. Is it broken? Absolutely. But you know what? Who cares? It's a PvE game. The best part of playing these kind of games, you know, similar games like Risk of Rain, is getting these absolutely ridiculous builds and just shredding everything. And it's not exploiting the game, you're just making full use of all the tools that the game is giving you. I just kind of see it as a byproduct of understanding and grasping what the game is throwing at you. And if they didn't want me to shred through entire groups of enemies with a lightning gun that sends out these homing projectiles constantly, well, they wouldn't have put it in the game to begin with. The best part of it too, though, is that none of this makes you immune to damage. I mean, you can still get curb stomped if you don't know what you're doing and none of this compensates for a lack of skill. But people who can understand the game and take advantage of all these implants and mechanics, not to mention who are gonna be good at the basics of the game, are gonna find this thing really damn fucking fun to play through. And I know I did. The biggest issue that Dead Link has though is the content or, you know, the lack thereof. But that is the expected outcome when you're playing something in early access and apparently a year off hitting that 1.0 version. Plenty of devs have proven time and time again that the early access model does work, but it is definitely a case-by-case -case basis. And look, I can understand why people don't want to drop money on something that is potentially never going to get finished. In the current build for Deadlink, there's two areas to get through. The first one's set in a very Neo Tokyo looking city, complete with neon signs and Akira styled motorbikes parked in the alleyways. You're fighting the Yakuza, Walker robots, and like futuristic looking sumos and ninjas. Along with taking down a corporate executive hiding inside a giant mech suit, the kind of mech suit that'll make Major Kusanaki just grin with envy. This is like the atypical cyberpunk backdrop and almost mandatory for this kind of game. And it really does look awesome with creative lighting effects and some striking environments. And of course in the future, there's a sex club on every corner. <laughs> Oops. 
and those short moments of respite you get in between each arena allow you to appreciate just how effortlessly good these environments look. And again, just how good the Unreal Engine can look when it's put into the hands of people who know what the fuck they're doing. Thankfully too, it seems to be a really well optimized game, at least from my end, and it's kind of like all these indie devs have made a deal with the devil to get their titles running so well. Then the second air is like a bunch of factories and laboratories. You've gone from breathing in polluted air to breathing in the processed air inside all of these generic looking facilities. The enemies are now comprised of guys wearing much more expensive looking combat suits. They seem more well trained and deadly and are clearly on the payroll of some super powerful conglomerate paid to protect that company's interests. Topped off by a boss fight against a 9 foot tall guy holding a large right shield. It's all definitely in contrast to the whole blue and yellow palette of the first area, which is kinda handy in differentiating both these areas. Overall, I think both of these areas look good, and yeah, they're fun to play through. And the different choices you can make at the end of each arena is really the major driving factor here for that replayability. Still though, you are gonna start to get a sense of deja vu very quickly. I definitely do have a couple of other issues too, like there's these annoying teleporting ninja enemies in the first area that just kind of seem broken, not really telegraphing their appearance at all. Plus there's a few iffy moments with the hit detection, and enemies who kind of treat you like you're a magnet and have this innate ability to home in on you constantly. The second boss fight I also kind of still struggle with at times, mostly because this guy is spawning in ads almost the entire time. And I know they're probably more there to help you keep your shield topped up, but they're just kind of distracting considering how small this arena is. This format was okay with the first boss, I think, because at least that time you've got more room to run around, and can engage with these essentially fodder enemies only when you really need to. For the second fight though, you almost have to clean house here, or else they're just gonna get in your way. And it just becomes kind of distracting considering the boss has some really damaging moves that make you really want to concentrate on what he's doing. After getting the hang of beating both of these areas, which only took me a few runs, you're really just running the same content over and over to try to max out all the player upgrades and each of the shelf's abilities. It's a pretty fast process, and even from a failed run, you can still get a fair few points to put into things to make it feel like you haven't wasted your time. But I think that's the ultimate question here, is just how long are you going to want to do this before it all starts to feel too repetitive? For me, I think I hit that mark around the 8 or so hour point, where it really just started to feel like I was going through the motions to get that next new upgrade. I think once I'd really grasped the hang of the combat, the game started to become pretty easy, and I was pretty much just stomping my way through everything. A greyed out menu during the shell selection kind of suggests they're going to be adding more difficulty modes in the future, and to be honest, that's probably for the best, because it definitely becomes easier here sooner rather than later. That's not to say the game being too easy is a bad thing. If anything, it shows you've entered that elusive fun zone, and you're clearly picking up what the game's putting down. But the more dedicated players are really going to appreciate having more crushing difficulty selections. Still though, I've got a lot of high hopes for this thing, and even though it's really just like a more advanced vertical slice of what's to come, this is just an incredibly awesome experience. So in terms of shooters that let you violently murder and destroy things in a rainy, neon soaked future, I've got to say man, this is definitely up there with the best of them. Right, so thanks for sticking around, and now let me tell you about the MSI GF76 laptop, built for the ultimate play. Now there's a bunch of these you can choose from, but recently MSI sent me one with an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3050 and 2nd gen RT cores. So I threw a few games at this thing to see how they ran, and I gotta say I was actually pretty surprised with the results. With games like Spider-Man Remastered, Ghostwire Tokyo, and God of War all running completely maxed out, not to mention they had RTX on as well. The benefit of that Nvidia card also means you can utilize DLSS for even better frame rates and a much higher fidelity. You've got a 17.3 inch HD screen here with a 240Hz refresh rate, and that Max-Q technology allows for better performance without turning this thing into a giant brick either. With dedicated thermal solutions for the GPU and the CPU, using more heat pipes than even your mum can handle, it means the performance doesn't come at the cost of the whole thing overheating. Which overall just makes this thing a bit of a beast for offline gaming at 1080p. The GF76 also has the benefit of high resolution audio output and lossless music, you know, for when you want to listen to Tay Day. So overall, I think this thing's pretty damn awesome, and if you want to find out how to get your hands on one of them, well, check out the link in the video description below.